Uh, we have an agenda in front of us, colleagues, and we have four of us here, four distinguished august gentlemen, uh, starting uh, with my far left over there, not a pun or anything, Paul Koretz. Next to him is Tom LeBond, and on the right side of me is Bernard Parks, and I'm Bill Rosendahl, the chair. So we have four out of five members here. So Mr. So chair, can I just make a motion to sure other pressing business related to finances? If uh, in this agenda, if people need additional time, you give it to them. But we have one minute public comment on the clock. That's fine with me. And if anybody goes over the minute because it's an obvious issue that they want to speak more, I ain't going to beat you out. You can continue to talk. But we're, we're trying to move quickly because some of my colleagues, including myself, have another engagement we want to go to right after this. But that's okay. Consent items, uh, colleagues. Um, one, two, three, and seven. Has anybody got an issue with that? What's one, two, three, and seven? Fine. I'll move them. So moved by Mr. Parks. And let me see if we have any cards on one. We have what card on one? Oh, that's special one. Okay. One, six. Hey, uh, Jesse Brewer yeah. Park still stays, right? I don't have anything, right? No. Okay, great. Jesse Brewer Park. Okay, so Mr. Stays. Parks made the motion. Uh, one, two, um, uh, three, and seven. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that's great. And then uh, there is a, to continue two items uh, requested uh, by Paul Krikorian because it's in his district and he wants to study it. And uh, there might be people here for this. Item five is one of them. Uh, and I have one, two, three, four cards, so I don't want to continue until you get a chance to speak since you came down here. But uh, as respect to my colleague, uh, he wants time to review this. He's the new guy in the block, and, and I want to show him that respect. So we will take um, the item uh, five that he wants continued, and we will not continue it until after the public comment. Can I ask a question? Yes. Is any of his deputies of here? So they could hear. Is that deputy from Mr. Koretz? Good. Thank you very much. From Mr. Kokorian? Yeah, correct. Thank you. And Mr. Kokorian's office. Thank you very much, you Mr. Koretz. you got here, you know. I, I know. knew this was going to cause them. Yeah, kind of yeah, exciting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, good. Okay. It's the people so, came down from the district they wanted to hear. That's absolutely right. And we have the uh, West Traffic, them here. Valley Traffic. Okay. So on, on item number five, which um, uh, is Mr. Koretz's and Mr. Kokorian's area, uh, I know Mr. Koretz and, and of course, Mr. Labanja here, too. So what we'll do is, um, uh, does anybody have a problem with continuing item six? Do we have cards in that? We have six we have cards in that, too. Sorry about that, folks, but we'll go through that, too, then, just out of respect for you coming down here. Uh, but we're going to leave the record open and continue them out of respect uh, for Mr. Cor Mr. Krikorian. Okay, item number five. Item number five is a DOT report and ordinance relative to the speed limit revision for Riverside Drive be, uh, between Claiborne Avenue and Van Nuys Boulevard. Thank you, Maria, for that. Appreciate it. And, and could we ask uh, Jay A. Goldberg to come on up, uh, Stephen Box to come up, Dorothy Lee to come up, and Donna Cassad? Cassad. Okay, great. Okay, this is item number five. Marie just, uh, uh, Maria just mentioned it. So let's just go forward. Um, uh, we could start with you, please, oh, your okay, name. Sure. Hi, I'm Dorothy Leff. I'm Los Angeles County Bicycle Coalition. Um, this item is a proposed speed limit increase for those um, streets. And just want to say that we really think that it's more dangerous if you increase speeds, even though there's issues. Um, the, the reason it's being done is due to um, policy that's been set. Um, but Santa Monica um, um, has been able to slow some streets down using similar policies. Also, um, especially with the bicycle master plan coming up and the anti-harassment um, issue that you heard this morning, it's really important that in, um, conflicts between bicyclists and pedestrians and cars will certainly increase if you increase the speed. So please um, take a stand and slow the speeds. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. And do make comments to Mr. Krikorian as well, his, his staffer. Where, where are you in the room? Step out. There he is. Uh, please uh, chat with him and do a sidebar after this is over as well, okay? okay. Ma'am. I'm Donna Cassid, and um, I'm one, I don't know if you read the Times, was it yesterday, about the um, Long Beach bicycle plan, but I'm one no, of the paunchy, middle-aged road bikers referred to. Thank you very much. 
Um, I think it's really important to keep speeds down, especially because of what happened to me Sunday when I was climbing La Tuna Canyon and a speeder came up behind me, pulled over to the side and skidded, turned around laughing at me and pulled off skidding. And I, I stayed on my bike, but very, very, with a lot of fear and anger. Um, it's really important to pay attention to us. We, um, we have other forms of transportation in this city that are green and that are important. And I'm thrilled as a middle-aged old cyclist to see how many of us are out there. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you for coming today and also for your comments. As you might have caught this morning, uh, my colleagues were very strong with me uh, on, on taking this Bicycle Bill of Rights to the next level, which is the issues where bicyclists feel uh, their rights have been violated. And on the 24th of February, we're going to have Charlie Beck, the new chief, is going to, and the meeting is going to be devoted to understanding this issue for him, for his top guy who's going to be uh, the bicycle person for him, and it will help us create that ordinance. So you can come back for that and share stories. It will be well received. Thank you. And Rita Roberts has entered the room, so she's here. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Sir. I'm Jay Goldberg. I'm from the Greater Toluca Lake Neighborhood Council. I chair the Public Safety Committee. We've been objecting to this whole proposal going back uh, to its origins, as we recall it, uh, based on several things. Speed limit is, is presently posted at 35 miles an hour. It's not enforced at all. And this is going to invite uh, traffic to exceed that limit, uh, 40 mile an hour limit, probably going on up to 50. Uh, at 40 miles an hour, uh, LAPD, regardless of what this law says, what this regulation says or what the state says, uh, is not going to be enforced because LAPD is not going to have any more resources to do so. They don't presently enforce it. Not, magic is not going to happen. We're installing a new signal sometime this summer at one of the intersections, which will create three consecutive signals. That will either slow traffic down or it will increase traffic in order to, in order to uh, uh, meet those, uh, pass those signals. And that's going to create a, a greater hazard. Uh, we're suggesting, or I suggested personally in one conference call, to reduce the speed limit to 25. I was told that in order to do that, uh, they would take the signs down. I said, fine. That'll make it very easy for any black and white that does happen to come along. To, to issue a ticket. Plus, uh, you've mentioned Mr. Krikorian. He has uh, AB 766 when he was in right. the state legislature, and that was brought to our attention, and we, and we agree com uh, uh, completely with that, that communities should be permitted to establish their own priorities, and this is one of them. I have some correspondence from some of it's dated. One is, is of today. Great. That, we'll take it. Sure. Sure. That is for uh, the committee's uh, review. Very good, very good. And I appreciate your comments. Uh, and uh, um, in fact, Mr. Corian and I's conversation this morning was just that legislation he was working on at the time. Okay. This is a copy of it, if it's of any use. Uh, please, yeah, sure. Be happy to receive that. Thank you very much for your comments. Stephen Bach. Stephen Box, how are you doing? I live in Hollywood. Uh, we've uh, discussed this issue quite a lot this past year. And in fact, the city council already endorsed uh, AB 766, I think, uh, about a year ago, and um, made it part of the legislative packet. And over the last year, we've discussed um, the speed trap law and the 85 percentile um, rule. We've debated the science versus opinion, and the LADOT has said that this is a process where motorists vote with the gas pedal. We've also just simply asked you to embrace the philosophy of safety and all of these efforts have failed because we keep approving these speed limit increases. Today I'd like to just offer up another appeal and that is to accept the fact that this is a flawed process. The city of Los Angeles is a very large city but it only maintains speed zone surveys and law enforcement authority with radar and laser on 700 segments and they're dropping rapidly. In fact, well, in six days, 11 segments dropped. So you don't have speed uh, limit violation enforcement with radar and laser in Washington, Magnolia, Glen Oaks, Laurel Canyons coming up to drop Fairfax, Foothill, Oxnard. 
this isn't working we don't have speed zone enforcement throughout the city and so this is the tip of the iceberg it's a it's a flawed process very much even and you very much again the deputy from Popoka Corian is in the room have a chat with him and we will continue colleagues any colleagues want to come in here from Valley Traffic and the Valley Engineer very good very good and Paul I have similar concerns about this even though we're we're probably going to pass on this for a while I have serious concerns about whether we should move it forward I think very good very good mr. Park do you want to say anything at this point okay Corian just walked into the room he could come in and testify it was his bill thank you very much perfect timing Tommy keep doing this we'll never get out of here well he came all the way up come on in well come on up and let me, let me just tell you and come on officers and come on DOT yeah. um, we just had a discussion with constituents uh, five of uh, four cards were pulled uh, from four different folks uh, basically saying don't raise the speed limit period uh, I said uh, we would let them speak uh, because they came here but we were going to continue the item unless you change your mind and don't want to continue it so you'll have an opportunity to say whatever you want thank you mr. chairman I very much appreciate it um, and I, we had a brief conversation earlier in which you were uh, very gracious in agreeing uh, to put this uh, matter over for decision I'd like to have the opportunity uh, to ask you to do that uh, to put this over so that I have an opportunity to review the uh, engineering reports relating at least to my district um, but I think in a broader sense uh, I know this is a uh, this is a challenge for all of us on the council because of the impact of state law which um, limits the ability of uh, the police to use uh, radar enforcement absent updated traffic reports and it is a thing that is going to have to be fixed at the state level to be sure I introduced legislation to do that to, to try to uh, provide an opportunity for local government to conduct hearings public hearings and to make a decision uh, that would be different than that compelled by the engineering report when there's reasons for public safety uh, that the local jurisdiction decides unfortunately state law continues to handcuff us in our ability to do that um, so for now I'd like to have the opportunity at least to review the engineering report so that I can come back on behalf of my constituents and talk to you in greater detail about about them at a future Great. And, and thank you for putting that legislation together up there. Many of us appreciated you doing that, and we hope somebody picks it up and runs with it and makes it law. And so far, uh, we haven't had very much success, uh, sadly. And I think it's it's something that the public is really going to have to rally around uh, to try to move Sacramento forward on this, because um, you know we, I, I think very often what happens is there's a focus on. Um, the science of setting speed limits um, but often the scientific analysis doesn't take into account the realities that we all know uh, exist in a particular uh, community in a particular neighborhood and, and only the people who live there have businesses there represent those areas often know better uh, than what the the engineers might be able to tell us thank you it makes sense to me as well um, colleagues anyone want to talk to our colleague before we ask the uh, DOT and LAPD who do you who was your biggest uh, uh, opposition in Sacramento to this the Auto Club small cities Central it, Valley it was in fact the Auto Club uh -huh. uh, and the Teamsters and the uh, Teamsters okay who had, had, had strong okay. opposition to it thank you gentlemen whoever want to tell us what this is I I'm also Troy Williams. I work Valley Traffic Division. I am the radar coordinator for Operations Valley Bureau. And it's my job to work closely with the Department of Transportation and the, uh, the community to help facilitate the speed limits, the engineering traffic studies. And I work directly with them. Well, the one thing I wanted to touch on real quick is the misconception that I hear every time I come to a uh, public forum. As the, the kind lady said here, we don't want to raise the speeds. The speeds aren't being raised. The speeds are already at their critical. The 85th percentile, we've already discussed that in the past. All we're doing is proposing that based on the results of the study that's dictated by law, state law, that this is where the speed limit be set. There's been studies. We have a study that shows that regardless of how high you raise the speed limit or how you, much you lower it, the speeds remain fluctuate the same within a mile of per hour or two. 
So the misconception that if we raise it from 35 to 40, everyone's going to go 50, as the gentleman seated here said, has actually been proven not to be accurate. Can you enforce the law right now out there? No, and that's the other thing I was going to say. Thank you, sir. Was one gentleman mentioned here that we're not enforcing the speed limit at all. That's because we legally cannot enforce the speed limit on Riverside Drive because the survey is expired. And via electronic means, such as radar or laser, we cannot enforce the law. And our Deputy Chief, or Deputy Chief Moore, now Assistant Chief Moore, has made it clear to our officers in the Valley that we're not going to go back to unsafe measures of chasing motors and matching their speeds, because when we do that, we put the citizen at risk longer and the officer. With the technology of radar and laser, we can efficiently stop this higher level of speed efficiently and quickly. And if the speed limit gets raised, now we can go out and do enforcement. But right now, Riverside is illegal to enforce with electronic measures. Gotcha. Thank, Thank you, you very much for that. Hi, my name is Brian Gallagher. I'm Senior Transportation Engineer with the Department of Transportation East Valley District Office. And the Transportation Department is here today to provide support for the Police Department to do the necessary traffic engineering studies as required by state law in order to allow them to resume enforcement or to begin enforcement on certain streets using either radar or laser enforcement of the speeds. For most of these speed limits, they've already been in place for either seven years or 10 years, and they've expired, and so a new study was necessary. When we do the new study, we send people out every quarter mile or half mile with uh, radar guns and measure the speeds. And then we look at all the speeds that we got for that street, and we determine what the speed is that 85% of the drivers are traveling at or slower. And that's called the critical speed or the 85th percentile speed. Once that speed is determined, then we're required to round it to the nearest five mile increment. So if that 85th percentile speed is, you know, 42 miles per hour, we round it down to 40 miles per hour. If it's 39 miles per hour, we'll round it up to 40 miles per hour. We're allowed to reduce the, the recommended speed limit by five miles an hour in two cases. One, where the accident rate is determined to be very high on that street. People are already driving at a certain speed. The high accident rate shows that they're not successfully able to, to drive that street without getting into a lot of accidents. So we can recommend that the speed limit be reduced by five miles an hour. And that's something that we always look for when we do a radar study. Something else is where there's a combination of the potential for objects in the roadway, either people backing out of driveways, pedestrians, <laughs> bikes, even deer, combined with a reduction in visibility, either by a hill or by a curve, or even by shadows from underneath an adjacent freeway overcrossing. And then if there's limited room for the drivers to maneuver around that, that's something that we want to protect the drivers from and ask for the speed limit to be reduced by five miles an hour. Mr. Gallagher, what's the speed limit in Burbank and Glendale on Riverside Drive? Uh, Is it the same? Because I think if it could be the same there, why can't it be the same in our town? I don't think it's the same, but they have the same laws to stand up to as the city of Los Angeles does. And when they get around to doing their speed limit, they have to follow the same process that we do. So if we increase or decrease ours, it may be consistent with theirs for today. But in a couple of years, when theirs expires, they're going to have to change theirs as well. We should, should we get state law that says 35 miles an hour on Riverside Drive? No. Uh, what would you recommend? Well, I'm recommending that, one, we, we follow the law. And two, within well, we the, make the law, so we want to change the we law. We have to follow the state You're law. You're the engineer. And then within the law, that we do our best to meet the needs of the community for that street, wherever it is that we're studying it. Rather than have a, a one-size-fits-all solution, though, for the entire city, the transportation works with the neighborhood councils that are involved with each street that we're studying. And we always believe big traffic, big streets, little traffic, little streets. And so we take the the type of street that we're working on into consideration. If it's designed as a major highway or secondary highway, we treat those a lot differently than if it's a local street going through a neighborhood. Now, there was a study by the Federal Highway Administration in 1992, and it, it produced some very interesting results that were kind of counterintuitive to our regular thinking. Uh, the first myth that they exposed is that raising speed limits 
increases the speeds. The reality is that drivers are going to travel at the speed they are comfortable with regardless of whatever the posted speed limit is. Now, from their study, they found that whether you increase the speed limits by 10 miles an hour or you reduce the speed limits by 10 miles an hour, the before and after critical speeds, the average of those speeds changed by less than one miles an hour. So whatever the speed limit is, the people are going to travel the speed that they feel comfortable. Brian, here's what we're going to do. Mr. Chair said we're going to continue this. Yeah, we're going to study it. But I think if we could give them a little sense of what we want to come back with, I think people want a 35 mile an hour speed limit. Knowing this street well, even outside my district, there's some parts that it, it, that it becomes a raceway. It becomes a raceway when you encourage it. So we'd have to somehow try to get legislation that does this, because safety is the number one goal, correct? The, the problem, even though safety is the number one goal, the problem is that that study also found that right. if you set the posted speed limit too study. far away from the critical speed, it actually causes an increase in accidents. Okay. As the posted All speed right. gets away from the, uh, more Mr. driving, Prince. accidents increase. Thank you. Now, I'm wondering if, if uh, what you're saying is that posting the speed and enforcement is a waste of time and doesn't have an impact, because if it really is we should be shifting all the expenditures we make of, of uh, having officers out on the streets uh, writing these tickets and doing the enforcement. If it winds up being at the same speed anyway, then we're wasting a lot of money and we should be changing our policy dramatically. May, so I, it, may it, I comment it, on that? Sure. Um, right now we can't not do any enforcement. We cannot target those motors for coming through Riverside at 50 53, 55 miles an hour. Those are the ones we want to focus on, not the motors that's going 40 or 45, but the motors that are pushing that 50 mile per hour barrier. And right now, we are, our hands are tied. So therefore, the those commuters that travel through there can run amok and drive as fast as they like. Well, I may, maybe I wasn't wasn't clear on what you're you're saying based on that study. Is it just the posting, or is the enforcement also have no impact, and the average stays just about the same anyway? The study that we're talking about doesn't re doesn't address enforcement. It <coughs> addresses what the speed limits are done based on whether you raise or lower. Because the myth is you raise the speed limit, people are going to drive faster. But that's the study shown that that's not the case. Uh, are there studies that that go the extra step and determine whether actually doing the enforcement and writing tickets impacts that, or is it possible that even so, I assume enforcement winds up being part of that factored in? Well. Enforcement is a tool and resource for the police department, so when there is a community outcry of speeding problem, we can go out and work it immediately. When there's no resource such as the survey, we can't do anything. We just have to say, I'm sorry, but we can't do anything at this time. Therefore, by having the survey in place, it allows the, the officer in the police department, upon request of the community, whether it be a city council member or an incident, there might be an incident where there was some speeding going on, resulting in a, in a fatal traffic collision, we can immediately go out and address that and target it, because the tool is there, the resource of the survey. Uh, well, uh, I'll ask one more time, and, and then we'll let it go for now. Can you tell whether it actually has an impact, whether, whether doing the enforcement if you have a, a traffic fatality because too many people are speeding, uh, does it have an impact when you send out an officer and write yes, the Yes, there is correlation between enforcement and reduction in traffic collisions. There's been shown that with the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration on their own website will show a correlation between enforcement, bringing speeds down through enforcement, and maintaining speeds through enforcement. There is a direct correlation between traffic enforcement and reduction in traffic collisions. So the bottom line of what you're saying is, Posted speed limits have no impact, but the actual enforcement is what has the impact. The posted speed limit is established by the survey. Then the enforcement just allows us to do our job at that particular time. But you want to set the posted speed limit close to what people are driving, or it will result in additional potential for accidents. And also, there's a lot of concern by the community that by setting speed limits and increasing enforcement, we're just doing it for the money. What we want to do is we want to set the speed limits at the speed that most people are already driving at so that only that those people, you know, 15 percent or so that are traveling in excess of the posted speed are going to be the one that gets the okay, tickets uh, and it will also result in safety right. improvements. Okay. Uh, this will be continued. Um, we have three council members who have a direct relationship to this. That's Mr. Corian, Mr. Koretz, and Mr. Levant. Uh, I personally, as chair of this committee, aside with the neighbors and with the bicyclists, I would rather have a lower speed 
uh, posted than a higher speed just because of safety that matters to me about the people who literally live in that block or that neighborhood around that particular street. But I'll let this discussion continue, but I, I'm compelled to say that I don't care what they do. Uh, the reality is if you post it or, or, or leave it at, at 35 and not raise it to 40, th there would be more comfort in a lot of people's minds. I have an issue like that that's 35 now. My people want to make it to 25. I want to do it at 25 because I want to respect the safety of the people who live in that block, regardless of what studies say or what the analysis are. So I'm inclined, no matter what, uh, to, to be more supportive of lowering it or not raising it, whatever the issue may be. But this will be for another robust discussion on this uh, with the three council members I mentioned whose street it is to continue it. So if we could at this point, colleagues, I want to continue this item like we suggested. Excuse me, are you continuing four, five, and six, or just five and six? Well, you're okay with it. Five and six. Five and six. Five and six, and you approve four? Yeah. Okay. Five and six is, is, are the two that, that he's asked for. We're going to continue those two. And what was the other one you said? Item four was another speed revision on uh, Beverly Glen Boulevard. Um, you're, you're okay with that? Yeah, I don't think that one has opposition. Uh, okay. So, and it's, so it's more smoothing out, so it's reducing so five by that. five and, and okay. increasing by five in another area, so it's easier to enforce. Okay, we'll go forward with that one. I'll just say something. Yes, go ahead. No, I, I just think that uh, after hearing this presentation about 800 times on, <laughs> on this subject is that if you arbitrarily reduce the speed and it's inconsistent with the flow of traffic, then what you'll end up with is people complaining about speed and the police have an inability to do anything about it. So that's basically that's what true. you're going to create. That's correct. And so if you set the speed limit based on the survey, you now have the tools to go out and impact the traffic because people will drive as to their what they think their ability is to get through the roadway. Mm -hmm. There's a small percentage of people who choose not to. That's who the officers go out and attempt to correct their behavior. And the number one impact on traffic violations is enforcement. And so if you want to have no tools and people driving at a speed above the sign because they feel comfortable and no ability to enforce it, then you'll arbitrarily reduce the speed and take away that tool. That's correct. M and Ed, pretty what was your first job in the uh, police department, <laughs> Mr. Park? <laughs> Undercover narcotics. Undercover. I thought it was traffic. That's where you did work traffic. You you did work traffic. Yeah, yeah, it's 6th and Broadway. Right? Yeah. They call it PIC at the time. Yeah. Right. Right. I wasn't a real traffic officer, just oh, okay. PIC. Mr. Chair? Yes. For, for just one moment, I wanted to uh, suggest that when this comes back for discussion, yes. that, uh, it all, that that discussion might also include those areas along Riverside Drive where the, um, where the speed rate would be uh, posted lower uh, because of schools. In fact, I attended Riverside Drive Elementary School uh, near Coldwater Canyon. Right. And uh, I believe that within a certain distance, it has to be posted at 25. And so when we have that further discussion, perhaps we could talk about uh, how that relates to the, to, the, uh, to the rest of this issue. Excellent. Let's one, make sure we do that. Off one important thing, I apologize. So when schools are present, we don't have to have a survey. We can enforce it regardless whether the survey is present or not at 25. That's one of the points I wanted to make. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask a fast question? Downtown Toluca Lake, can you post it at 25? And then when you get west of Coinga, open it up. That would make sense in the community. They understand that. And then when you get near places, look at that, Brian. Check with Glendale. Check with Burbank. No comment. Thank you. Next item. All right. Thank you, sir. We're taking a deep breath there, okay? We're going to continue items five and six. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for further discussion. Can you still speak on six? Can you still speak on six? Uh, sure you can. Of course you can. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, technically we can't continue until you've spoken on it, okay? But come on up, Donna, come on up, Stephen, again, and come on up, Dorothy. All three of you want to speak on it. What about this one? Six. Oh, wait, that's part of the continuum. Oh, right, right. Oh, very good, very good, very good, very good. Hi. Well, you've heard the discussion. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Come on, Stephen, you're up here, too. All right, please. Thanks. Dorothy from the LA Bike Coalition again. Um, it is interesting, and what made me think about and what point I wanted to also make was 
um, if you design a street a certain way that encourages drivers to behave slower. So, uh, yes, enforcement and post speed limits, but we know that the way a street is actually designed, if it's narrower or if you have um, more um, uh, bulb outs and traffic calming devices, um, um, actually trees have been shown to slow, to actually make drivers slow down. So I think that really needs to be looked at. Good idea. Um, not, ju not in isolation with this issue because um, design is a really important tool, another tool to, in, um, to encourage slower behavior. So adding bike lanes, adding wider sidewalks, that's going to make cars go slower naturally so that you can, we can work with LAPD to slow the traffic down because they will, the drivers will go slower because of that design. Very good point. Appreciate that very much. Dar Donna. Uh, Dorothy pretty much said what I was thinking as I was listening to the testimony that the, the piece that was lost there was that human beings can change their behavior. And when I was reading about what's happening in Long Beach and how people are actually transforming what they're doing and beginning to drive more slowly when they are reading that when they are seeing that bicycles and cars are sharing the roadway in a different way, yeah. that's really important. It so it's not just surveys and laws, but also having the faith that people can change their behavior and want to, given the right circumstances. You're right. Thank you for that, too. Stephen. Stephen Box, I live in Hollywood. Um, one thing that uh, we didn't mention is the city's budget crisis. And cities around the country are bringing home phenomenal amounts of transportation funding to address infrastructure and to build road diets, in other words, to narrow streets and to include bulb outs, uh, to include other traffic calming devices like roundabouts and speed tables. And great cities around the world are able yeah. to control traffic without having to have a police officer standing by with radar and laser. The second thing this does, in addition to making our streets safer, is it brings money to Los Angeles. We're pursuing a 50-year-old paradigm. It's an old state law that we're abiding by, but it's also an old paradigm with only one tool in the toolbox, and that's law enforcement. We don't have enough officers to put on all the streets that have speeding problems. We don't even have the authority to enforce speed limit violations on most of the streets in Los Angeles. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And just a one line from, I got a lot of emails on this, says, to increase the speed limit further endangers the homeowners, pedestrians, and cyclists. Please do anything you can to do. No, no. So there's a general sensing of community on that. And we'll see how my three colleagues respond to it and, and where we take it. Thank you for coming. The item is continued into the next meeting, which is when, Maria? Our next regular meeting would be February 13th. February 13th? I think so. Okay. You sure? 10th? No, the 11th is tenth? Uh, the 10th. The 10th. Okay, then it's the 10th. 13th is uh, Saturday. 14th okay. is Sunday. Uh, we will resolve this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, on February 10th when it comes back before uh, the committee. Thank you all very much for that. Uh, Maria, what do we have left? We have item one on the Special Transportation Committee agenda, which is a DOT report relative to the status of the proposed on-street car share pilot program. Thank you very much for that. Tell us how it's been going there, my man. Good afternoon, council members. It's great to see you all. I have not seen you in a while, so it's great to happy see new you year. and happy new year to you as well. Um, what we have your name for the record. Oh, Amir Sadadi, Assistant General Manager, and I also want to uh, credit uh, two of my staff members that are unfortunately could not be here, Yadi, Hashemi, and Tamara. Um, they're actually the managers of this program, but they were unable to be here today. So what we have before you is a status report on the on-street car share pilot program. Um, just a little bit of background, this became um, state law as the CBC was changed to allow local counties and cities to pass resolution or ordinances to make certain portions of streets exclusive for the use of car shares um, on on street and as the city of Los Angeles followed the ordinances we were able to change our ordinance back on um, April 2009 and hence we pursued a um, competitive process to solicit interest in a lot of companies that did car sharing and Zipcar Inc was the only company that uh, participated in our program and in August of 2009 LADOT entered into a letter of agreement with 
zip car for a twelve month pilot program and the pilot program began on september fifteenth of two thousand and nine in two areas of the city which are adjacent to campuses of u s c and u c l a as part of the program we the department's responsibility and roles were identified in the letter of agreement and we provided spaces reserved spaces on street with signage and zip car was going to manage the program provide the vehicles and and see how this program is going to operate so in your reports and i believe zip car is also here today and they're going to speak to some of their results so we have a little bit of the findings in our report but generally the program has been very successful the growth has been extremely positive even within their own plans a typical market has a fifteen to twenty percent growth in six months and thirty percent in one year and we saw that growth within one month as of december of two twenty two i'm sorry tip in a typical market what zip car has mentioned to us that they see anywhere between a fifteen to twenty percent growth in their program and first six months and then up to thirty to thirty five percent in one year in this program so almost a thirty five percent increase within one month yeah so program has been successful and i think part of the success also the fact that you this was introduced in an existing market where zip car had on campus programs within usc and ucla so it was a good uh... it was a business model that they wanted to try first and again they'll be here and they'll speak next and they you can ask some uh... specific questions from their from their point of view so i think i'll leave a lot of the results of the their findings they can probably walk you through that more but obviously what we also want to let this committee knows about some of the challenges i think the biggest challenge is the the reality of the fiscal crisis that we have uh... the parking permit division is the division where uh... the the folks are managing not only the preferential parking the overnight parking dealing with the coastal commission and other uh... parking programs so since this was yet another permit program we felt that that's the group within d o t that would manage it uh... however this group is currently at a twenty two percent vacancy rate we have one person actually uh... on a disability uh... long disability and we also have uh... two people that possibly will go under erip so we're currently about fifty percent vacancy rate with this division uh... i think as some of your uh... Um, districts are aware the increase in requests for temporary per preferential parking and so workload keeps increasing staffing and resources keeps decreasing so i just wanted to get the committee to be aware of the challenge and really look at that carefully if if there are considerations given to future expansion of the program and i think one recommendation we had in our budget uh... proposal was perhaps the parking permit division and functions can be moved under the special parking revenue fund in order to reduce the burden on the general fund so that's something that we had put in uh... as a as a potential fix a uh, number of other challenges that um, currently within the first few months we have observed has to do with uh, one being uh, what we call lack of local staffing uh, or lack of local presence in Los Angeles. Um, Zipcar has local vendors. They, they contract for fleet maintenance and cleaning the car share spaces. Uh, however, their nearest representative in this region is in San Diego. Um, and the reason we, we think that that's a key challenge is um, one, of the pro one of the other challenges that we have faced is when Zipcar vehicles are returning to their designated spaces, um, some of the general public, because of the high demand for parking in those areas, people are taking their chances in parking in those spaces. So sometimes the vehicle uh, renter um, or user is returning the vehicle in a location that's other than what was reserved and designated. And unfortunately, those spaces then could be street cleaning or other forms get either ticketed or towed. Um, we are going to meet with uh, Zipcar. We actually had a good meeting with them this morning. And we're going to also see if there are ways to use street sensors and other technology and transponders to perhaps better inform them and us where the vehicles are or where the vehicles should be. So that's, that's one thing we're going to continue to work with them. As far as um, 
general public, we have issued a lot of citations and tows in those areas uh, in order to change the, the behavior and, and identify these spaces as being reserved for the car sharers. So we have um, done that and we are continuing to do that. Uh, again, as I mentioned, as one of the challenges is the where um, car share vehicles or zip cars are also getting ticketed and towed. Uh, we're really looking at the um, program or, or tickets case by case to see what the validations are and working with them on that. But you know, that's that's I think one of the the key challenges of an on street where you have the difficulty in in reserving that space. Where in off street you might have gates or other controls, uh, cones and other things that you can do um, better signage for. One other challenge that we're working with is the special events. I think one of the locations near the Shrine Auditorium um, gets, uh, there's a lot of street closures and special events, so unfortunately that area gets um, closed and we're trying to improve our communication with them as, as you know, with with notifications, but we're also going to see if we can move that location to somewhere else where it's less subject to less street closures and, and hence um, uh, towing. Uh, also, I think we want to talk a little bit about policy considerations for you in, in this few months that we've provided this program. We, the department feels that this is a strong tool um, in, in our transportation demand management goals and. Uh, we're just not clear if it's going to be the only solution for an on-street. I think a more comprehensive approach, uh, looking at um, uh, on-street, off-street, and, and other programs as well, uh, would be worth considering. And, and, and I think you get into this debate um, and conflict of having turnover, having those high demand areas being able to turn over, and then having the right amount of vehicles and there for public to use. Uh, we have uh, started talking uh, with MTA and, and, and I believe CLA has also talked to MTA, but a, a more goal-oriented uh, car sharing program at transit stations to enhance and encourage more transit use uh, would be a, um, a good program also to, to consider, uh, especially in transit-oriented districts. This could be used by um, transit users during the business days and nights and weekends. It could be used by the residents uh, of the nearby uh, transit, transit oriented districts. Uh, one other consideration um, is with, again, our fiscal crisis, uh, consideration can be given to car shares being used for pool vehicles. They, they could be municipalities could use them during the days and uh, public can use them again nights and weekends. So those are some, some policy considerations. As far as next steps, um, uh, it is true that Zipcar has good, strong programs in Boston, London, Toronto, Washington, D.C. for on-street. I just think it's too early within the three months that we have to determine um, if the on-street is going to be a, a, has the same components here with City of Los Angeles. As I mentioned, we've done this in a um, uh, existing campus environment, so moving this to Hollywood or other areas, it's just too early to determine if we're going to have the same um, positive results. But what we are requesting is to continue the pilot, um, the 12-month pilot. I know we're going to limp along with the staffing and the resources we have and be able to come back to this committee in the 120 days where we have better information to perhaps give you uh, better detailed findings and, and final recommendations. Um, Four months of now is as we're doing the budget process and maybe some of the issues of how it would be structured and, you know, revenue fund project might take some of that pressure off, too. Those would be all good conversations to have, uh, yeah. Council Member. In the meantime, I, I think it is worth um, talking uh, uh, to some of the other departments. Actually, planning department has done some work um, regarding a lot of work uh, and studies that have been done. So we recently met with them and actually they're on board and we like to continue to work with the planning department in incorporating car sharing in some of the uh, land use policies and development um, related mitigation measures. Uh, they're here and they, they support that. Um, working with the Metropolitan Transportation Authority to look at existing and future transit um, operations with the expo lines coming up, you know, we can, we have an opportunity to look at that. Yeah. Uh, look at the public and park, uh, public and pr private off-street lots as well to see if there are 
some programs where it would help um, gauge some of the experience that we can get by having car share in those types of facilities. And I think at the end of the day, um, come back and see if there are um, a good broad description of a car share program as, as we think for Los Angeles and maybe draft criteria and qualifications for future expansion. Yeah. So in a nutshell, I think that's where we are. It's an exciting program. Uh, we're happy that uh, we're working with Zipcar. Uh, there are challenges that we're going to work through and we would like the time to come back and give you more detailed findings and recommendations in 120 days. Thank you. And colleagues, what I'd like to do is, is ask the two public cards to come up and then Zipcar and Amir, just say to the left there so you're on here to take any questions from my colleagues and me as well. Let's just get Hillary up and, and Stephen Box up uh, to comment where they want to comment on this uh, and then we'll go right to the Zipcar people coming up and doing it. And just for, for full disclosure, uh, Alex Fay, who used to be on my staff, played a major role in this happening. We wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Alex's leadership with me. And I'll never forget when we had a little press conference out there. I singled him out for his leadership on this. And so I'm glad you're in the room, Mr. Fay. Please. Go ahead, Go ahead Hillary. I've been here first. That's okay. He's been up twice already. Go for okay. it. Okay. Hi, my name is Hillary Norton, and I'm the executive director of FAST, Fixing Angelino Stuck in Traffic. And one of our important traffic solutions is car sharing and we really believe in the Zipcar model. We'd like to see more of the Zipcar work on off street rather than on street because we think that the real estate on the streets is very important to save for transit. However, zip cars and car sharing in general is so crucial for a, a first mile, last mile solution and we are looking forward to working with Zipcar for places like Pershing Square next to transit stations that are off street lots and visible off street surface lots throughout downtown and in Hollywood, Century City and other places because car sharing, especially with the new um, iPhone models where you can find the cars wherever they are, is really crucial. You don't have to necessarily see them on a city street to know where they are and to be able to rent them. And we just support them as a really important model for transportation demand management. Thank you very Thank much. You. And, and also, obviously, talk to our mayor in the department as you talk to zip cars. We're all in the same way, Mike. You're up, yeah. Stephen. Stephen Box, I live in Hollywood, just off Hollywood Boulevard, a famous boulevard. And when people get off the red line at Hollywood and Western and then begin to walk toward the Walk of Stars, um, one thing they uh, find is if you want to get around, you need to rent a car. You just can't find a car rental. So I've been working with Bashir of Hollywood Rent-A-Car. He wants to put like community cars right there in Hollywood, which means that we could also live the car-free life but have a car available if we wanted to go and rent one. So I'd like to propose that we also include small business people. They're the backbone of our economy. And uh, Bashir has had nothing but an uphill battle. And so we've been told that every junction or juncture, whatever, yeah, something like that, huh? Uh, we hear a lot of no's or why things are difficult. We just want to make it work. And we find that Santa Monica has um, charging stations similar to what he's asking for. We went looking for these zip cars out by USC and UCLA. We couldn't find them. The neighbors didn't know they were there. We found the spaces because I was looking for the signs. But they were occupied by other people's cars. Anyway, the point is, it's, 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 I was looking for them and I couldn't find them. I found some on the roof of a garage. The long and the short of it is, it's Hollywood. They should be visible. I agree. And we uh, need to encourage small business people who want to be part of the process. And so far, we've been shut out. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I appreciate your thoughtful comments on that. Come on up, Zipcar. Zip along with us. Alex, do you want to come up and introduce him, or are you happy to sit in the back? Okay. Gentlemen, 35% increase. Very good. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like, to, I'd like to compliment you on your water bottle, first of all. Thank you very much, everybody. But, um, <laughs> Uh, members of the committee, my name is John Zeidler. I'm uh, Vice President for Corporate Development for uh, Zipcar. My name is Richard Paisner. I'm the Senior Account Manager who manages the overall Zipcar City of Los Angeles program. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, in many ways, I guess I feel like we're, you know, I know the cities are sort of early stage and really thinking about this, so I, I sort of feel like we're here as a spokes, kind of a spokesman for, for car sharing in general, although obviously we're talking about Zipcar. Uh, again, I know there's a lot for you to, to think about as you move forward on this. Um, I, I know most of you are familiar with car sharing, but just a, a really quick primer just to make sure we all know what we're talking about here. Um, very different from traditional rental car in that it's a distributed fleet of vehicles. 
made available to members in and around where they live and work. That's the whole key to really be uh, local and visible and, uh, and close to where you, you will need this day to day. Um, it's really a self-service model, um, and you, you make reservations through the web, online, and by phone, by touchstone phone as well. And part of what we do, uh, I think a good job at, is really making that easy. Have a, an iPhone app we just came out with, but generally make it easy uh, through a reservation system to do this and have you go and get your own own vehicle. It's uh, part of being easy is make is all inclusive pricing, which also includes gas and insurance. So the hourly rate you get is you see you, you know you you get what you see. It's sort of an obvious thing. There are not a lot of sort of upsells and and hidden stuff. It's you know trying to make it really easy and understandable. Um, and also very important to be sort of an attractive, efficient fleet of vehicles because what you're, you're trying to convince people to give up owning a car. And so this has to be something that they're attracted to doing. So, so um, essentially car sharing is designed as a replacement for car ownership really, not as competition for car rental. Um, the whole idea is that it makes a car available for you so that you can, instead of having it be your primary way to get around, it becomes part of a suite of transportation services you're using along with transit. It's very good for us to have good strong transit, to have bike sharing, to have all these other, other modes of transportation. Um, a lot of very well documented benefits to car sharing, taking vehicles off the road. Uh, a lot of independent studies have showed that up to 15 privately owned vehicles come off the road for every car sharing vehicle that goes into service. Um, reduced driving, our members report, we, we have a really good dialogue with our members and they report um, uh, driving 40% fewer miles than before they joined car sharing. Uh, reduced overall demand for parking, and again, we're taking cars off the road. Um, over 50% of our members report selling an existing car or avoiding buying a second car or a new car. Um, so again, reducing demand. Ultimately, the idea here is by even by putting cars on street, you're reducing demand for parking in the long run. Um, and the, also, we, we see uh, unanimously sort of reporting uh, increased use of other modes of transportation, generally 20% increase in transit use and 10% increase in biking among our membership. So you know, this you can sort of see how it sort of emerges. Is you know, we n nobody in Carsing, I don't think, would claim to be the full answer, but certainly is a, it's could be a very interesting part of the solution. Um, in terms of the pilot program, um, we've we've actually offered a car sharing program for some time now on the UCLA and USC campuses, uh, but in beginning of September, we started working with DOT on the on the pilot. The idea being to, to see how it worked to sort of expand beyond that central area. The program now consists of 16 vehicles, soon to be 18. We have two more that we're about to place uh, around UCLA. Um, uh, and again, this is an on-street pilot, as you know. Um, really, just sort of takeaways, top-line takeaways from uh, from Zipcar's perspective. Very strong utilization. The 35 percent. So the percentages you heard uh, Amir um, quote really is uh, has to do with utilization percentages. What makes a viable car sharing service is utilization of the vehicles. You know, 40 plus percent utilization uh, makes it viable. You don't, if you have it too high, you, you run into the, the problem you heard uh, the gentleman mention about cars not being available. You have to, people have to feel comfortable that there will be cars available if they need them. On the other hand, you have to be able to make the business run. So it can't be very low utilization. Generally, it takes some time for utilization to ramp. What we saw in this program immediately was a ramp to more target levels or, and above, uh, pretty much uh, uh, right out of the gate, to the point where now we're over 50% utilization in some of these pilot spots, which is starting to get to the level where you're a little worried about, about availability. So that's why we, Rich has been working with, uh, with DOT on, on putting new spots in place, new uh, cars in place. So, so very high utilization right out of the gate. Um, very good mix of business, uh, um, of daytime, weeknight, and weekend usage. Typically in a startup phase, you'll see weeknight and weekend usage because it's really more of a, initially a consumer service. And then it's very important for the, for the business and for, to get the full benefits of it to get that business daytime usage up. Uh, one thing I'd really like to drill down on a little more as we look at further surveys is in usage patterns is why this, this uh, all really started out as a really even usage curve, even across business day usage in this pilot, which is actually another good sign for the service. So that's an interesting uh, data point for us. Um, we have 134 pilot members, uh, but also we have uh, in, in this community pilot program, we also have a pretty decent number, though, 300 uh, plus people from the US, USC and UCLA programs that are also have, have also made reservations on these vehicles. The 21 and over members of those programs can see these cars on their reservation system, and so they, they're using it as well. 
Um, one thing to point out is we, we haven't really marketed this. It's a pilot. We want to sort of go slow and see. So anything that's happening in terms of utilization, usage, member sign up is pretty pretty organic at this point, word of mouth. Um, and the average trip actually is seven hours, which again is interesting to us because it's much higher than than you'd normally see. You'd normally see three to four to five hours in some areas that, in uh, car sharing. We're, again, we want to do some surveying on this. We're speculating that this is such a big area and, you know, transportation at times of the day obviously can be a problem. So, you know, it may just be that people are grouping trips and just really it's taking two to three hours longer than it might uh, in another location to, to get errands done. So um, in terms of, of why so successful so soon, we're, we're speculating here, but really, you know, obviously familiarity of the program in that area is a, is a big deal. It's a, those two schools are very good anchors for the program. Uh, strong car location, you know, being we've gotten pretty good at, at figuring out, and we've been working with DOT and trying to figure out, you know, where, do the, where should these cars go, where will the demand be. And, you know, again, obviously there are things to work through with on-street, but it's, I mean, the fact is that visibility, a visible on-street presence is about as, as good as you can do in terms of getting a program like this visible and, and getting early usage out there. So those are those are three things we would point to. We we also um, we're very eager to do to survey the membership, which we're going to do with DOT as part of the program. We talk to our members a lot. It's, it's very much a two-way communication street, and uh, we've done some initial surveying. And I just want to highlight some things we're hearing from from people. Uh, we got 400 survey responses, so that's a that's a pretty good uh, set of data. This includes pilot program members as well as university community members as well. Um, how, car, how the cars are used generally one to two times per month. We're, seeing, we're hearing from people who responded across a range of, of things, um, errands, retail, shopping, exploring the city, uh, personal needs, groceries, doctor's appointments. It, it pretty much runs the, runs the gamut uh, in terms of how they're using these cars. Uh, we're hearing from people that uh, there's, this is greatly increasing their mobility. Nearly nine out of ten members say they're able to get places they couldn't get to before with 80% saying they feel that it increases their independence. Um, there are fewer cars on the road. About 80% said that uh, the service enabled them to postpone the purchase of a car. Uh, just over half said they were making fewer trips. And 80% said they are making more multi-purpose trips. This is a pretty typical pattern. You see people grouping. You know, if you're charging by the hour, you see people group trips together, trying to be more efficient about what they do. Um, People living a healthier lifestyle, again, with a mix of tra transportation, about 40% of members are reporting that they are walking more, and 60% said that they're uh, biking more than before now that they're members and they have this as an option as opposed to car ownership. Um, th this tends to be a real money saver for people. If you really do the all-in calculation of what it costs to own a car, it's, you're talking about typically five to $600 uh, per month. Uh, in fact, you know, we've done a lot of surveying about the percentage of the American family household budget going to transportation. And, you know, it's amazing to see usually it's sort of north of 15% in many, in many cases. Um, and then when you see people joining uh, car sharing uh, schemes that it tends to fall below 10%. And we're seeing that, that here that uh, about 65% or two out of every three members say they're saving money after joining the program as opposed to before. Um, and, you know, no surprise to us, a lot of people are saying that the on-street uh, on locations 69% uh, of those surveys said the on-street spots make it more likely that they, they will join and use car sharing. So uh, so some, some really interesting initial data on that. We look forward to really sort of more formally surveying the membership so we can report back uh, more usefully. Um, there are certainly challenges, you know, and we continue to work through, through those with uh, DOT. As they pointed out, there's, uh, uh, and this is, again, not unusual for an early stage program, you have people with an on-street pro program. You have people parking in car-sharing spots, even with the markings and the signs. Uh, so enforcement of that is very important, and, and trying to, to be efficient about how we do that, and so that people learn that this is not something you can do. Uh, and then also working with DOT on the issues of you know Zipcar members returning cars, seeing that the, the space is occupied, parking them somewhere else, and having issues with ticketing there and with street cleaning. We we think this is not again atypical for for an early on-street program. And we definitely feel like there are things we can do uh, in terms of communications and response that will uh, that will help that um, going forward. So, um, in conclusion, uh, we think the car sharing pilot has been a strong success, and really is a reflection of the solid partnership initially with the city. Um, it, you know, it really provides a small window into the potential value of, value of car sharing in the area. Uh, you know, the success is a result of a, of a deliberate and strategic approach, really building on the success we've had in that area. Um, going forward, you know, we, we definitely think 
uh, Los Angeles has great potential for car sharing. It obviously presents many difficulties as well. It's not your, your classic car sharing city. I'm sure you, you've heard this story. It's you know, very spread out. Vertical density may not be the same. Everybody's wed to their cars, and uh, mass transit is, is you know, building up more and more, but isn't what it is in some other places. Um, but we still think in the long run it's a very interesting car sharing city. We, our, our issue is to really sort of be very measured about it. And uh, you know we would applaud the city's um, approach with uh, piloting the program. It will be, I think, one one thought to, to put it out there is that you know the, to when you're thinking about next steps with us or anybody else, piloting the program so that you, you're getting away from the university setting to another very attractive area. Hollywood is one that's been mentioned, and there have been others that I know have been been mentioned with, with with transit and and other you know other areas. So. Um, so, you know, that's something I would, I'd say to think about. Again, uh, our only point is to really try to, we want to do this in a sustainable way that, that will work uh, for, for us and, and not require a lot of sort of long-term subsidy and things like that. And so we're, we're interested in taking a measured step-by-step -step approach. So, Thank you. Did you want to add something? Okay. I, I think that, um, I think John really hit on everything. And the one thing I, I would include is that certainly DOT has done a great job in supporting the program short staff and, and otherwise and, and I think yeah, as we continue to work through and grow the program and work through the conversations that we had through this morning I think the membership as well as just the overall program will will bubble with it so Mr. Kretz. yeah I just have a, a fiscal question which is how much does this cost the city in terms of lost revenue from the spaces we're giving up and um, impact on Westwood especially which is desperately short of spaces is there is it worth it doing it this on street, or is it something that should be moved off street? Um, that's a great question, Councilmember Koretz. And keeping the fiscal um, venue in mind, we chose specific areas where there are no on street meters. So the current locations, both at USC and UCLA, are uh, non metered and non revenue generating um, locations in the street. To answer your other part of your question, uh, since this was a pilot program and the parking permits division is currently under a, you know, the general fund of the city, so we are absorbing the staff hours, the signage, and some of the other, you know, program uh, programmed hours that is um, attributable to this program. And those costs right now are roughly maybe ten to fifteen thousand dollars so far. Are there any special funded areas that could? Uh this could could be used to be pick, to pick up this program. Uh, again, if the council, as an authoritative body, instructs the city attorney to include parking permits division into the special parking revenue ordinance, then then we could use that special fund to then pay for salaries and signage and posting uh, of these signs if we were going to expand them. But right now, this program is under general fund, and as you know, we have no funding and overtime or anything else to, to manage it. So we're absorbing all the costs. Take Mr. Koretz's question one further. The three months we've had it in operation, what does it cost us? Uh, roughly, I think it's about ten to $15,000. Don't, I don't have the exact details, but those are just staffing and signage and posting of the signs. And um, so it's roughly around there. Any more questions, Mr. Koretz? Mr. Parks. OK. So uh, great reports and appreciated everybody's comments on that. The recommendation is to approve the department's recommendation to report back in 120 days and continue to coordinate efforts with city planning and metro. Mr. Chair, if I could add to that, sure. that uh, we explore whether the cost of this could be moved to, to special funds. So moved. So good. Mr. Park, you're with that? And the special, would that be special parking revenue? Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the ordinance would have to be the ordinance would have to be changed. You can't well, just move this program. I think we can also look at whether Prop C or Prop A, which have their own problems as well, need to do this. This should not be general funded. Thank you, Maria. That's a good one. So let's put that all in that motion. I have a second on that. Okay. Second. So moved. Uh, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Maria, anything else? No, that's it. Any other public comment? Any other subject here? Not hearing any. Meeting adjourned. Thank you all very much. What time? Five o'clock. And I want to stop by the supermarket, pick up stuff, put it in the dinner, pick back and